Praise the Lord, church. I'm excited to be here tonight. Excited to talk to the Lord. Let me, let me just remind you of something. I pray that you've left something with God in prayer tonight that he can really work through. You know, <clears throat> Scripture tells us the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And Jesus himself said, you know, whatsoever things you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. So I want to bring some things to God with that spirit of faith and, and uh, confidence in my heart every time I come to him in prayer, knowing that he's always listening and he always cares. Praise God. I hope that's your desire. I'm excited about the word tonight as I sat in church this morning. How many of you were in church this morning? <clears throat> so you heard Pastor Tamil's message. Um, I had thought for a moment there that he had uh, stolen my notes and was going through some of them. Uh, so many key scriptures and concepts that run parallel to this message, but I had no idea what he was preaching on, so it's always kind of exhilarating uh, when you feel like you may have something that's God-ordained. So I pray you open your hearts tonight. I want to talk to you about the importance of knowing God, and uh, you might be surprised at uh, what it really takes to know him. Key scripture is one that pastor used this morning, and we know it well. Uh, Matthew chapter 22, teacher they asked Jesus, which is the great commandment in the law? And of course, we know Jesus said, you know, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind <clears throat> and with all your strength. That is still the greatest commandment. And it is the one commandment above every other one that we must strive to fulfill. So here's the big question for all of us. Do we know how to fulfill that great commandment? Do we really know how to love God that deeply? That is an extremely important question. Because if you want to love somebody, you have to get to know them. And you have to get to know them in an intimate way. You have to spend a lot of time with them. You need to talk about nearly everything that is meaningful to you. You need to share your, your hopes and your dreams. And you can't really love someone if you don't really get to know them. That's what it's all about. So it's so important. And I find the Apostle Paul spoke about the importance and the privilege of knowing Jesus Christ. He, he stated in Philippians 3, <clears throat> he said that I may know him, just a simple statement. He went on a verse later and said, if by any means I may attain to eternal life, I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I just sense a deep longing in his statement. It wasn't a simple, you know, that I might know him. It was, oh, how I want to know him. In fact, he said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, and I'm even willing to know him in the fellowship of his suffering. There was nothing more important to Paul. He said in another point in that same epistle, I count all things lost for the mere excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. I count everything lost just to be able to say, I really know him. So he valued his relationship with Jesus Christ as more important than anything else, which is what we must do. We need to value knowing Jesus Christ and having a relationship with him more than our home and more than our job and more than our money and more than our friends, more than personal comfort, more than the pleasures that we can derive in this world. This is the most important thing, to know God. And I don't know about you, but I believe our society has lost sight of that. I believe they've lost sight of how important it is to really know Jesus Christ. I mean, can you imagine how awesome it really would have been to actually have been on planet Earth and walked with Jesus, to known him personally, to touch him, to eat with him, to watch him do the miracles, to hear him, to come face to face with his love, to have been one of those early disciples. How amazing that would be. I mean, what really, what could be greater than knowing the King of kings and the Lord of lords? The king above every king. What could be greater than loving him with all of our heart? But here's part of the problem. There are so many worldly distractions. There are so many things that contend for our affection and contend for our love. And you know what? A lot of them are very trivial. <clears throat> I mean, we say, I love pepperoni pizza. I love sleeping in on Saturday mornings. I love that song. I, I love my car, whatever. 
But do we ever really say that about God? Are we ever overwhelmed with the fact that we just love him so much? Do we love him more than anything? Now, here's the reality. You won't love him more than anything until you really get to know him. That's what this message is going to be about. <clears throat> so what do we need to know about God? If we're really going to be able to love him with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, and with all our strength, what do we need to know? I'm going to give you a, a short list of things, but the first thing is we need to know his love. And the pastor talked to us about that this morning. A one-sided love relationship is not very exciting, is it? It never works long term. So how deep is his love? Well, it's as deep as Calvary. There's that song by Casting Crowns about, you know, <clears throat> how, how far is this whole thing? Well, as far as the east to the west, you know, outstretched hands with nail-pierced scars. Jesus Christ's love is as deep as Calvary. And the Bible says God is love and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God, okay? So we need to know his love if we're going to really know him. Now, I don't know about you, but before I knew him, I feared him. But I'm not here 40 years later serving him because I fear him. I came in contact with his love, and that's how I really experienced his love for me and got to know him on such a deeper level. I'm convinced there are a lot of insecure Christians who don't really know how much God loves them. They worry about their eternal destiny. They worry about their relationship with God. They really can't imagine sometimes when they're falling short and they're failing that God really loves them. They haven't gotten close enough to him to absolutely know beyond a shadow of a doubt how much he loves them. And that's in part because they don't know his word. They haven't read his love letters. They haven't read what he said about how much he loves the church. They really have not grasped the beauty and, and the magnificent aspect of Calvary's love. So it starts with, if we're going to really know God, we need to know his love. But we also need to know his will for our lives. We, see, we can't just do our own thing in life and expect or hope that God puts his stamp of approval on what we're doing and then say we've got this great knowing relationship with him. That, that would be a very selfish type of relationship, wouldn't it? I mean, it's natural. We attempt to please the people we love by doing the things that they desire. We understand that. We do it for our spouse. We do it for our children all the time. It's an expression of our love for them. And you know what? My wife expresses her will to me, and because I love her, I do my best to do her will. But you know what? I can't really do it if I don't know what she desires. So sometimes I simply ask her, what do you want? What do you desire? What will make you happy? I want to know so that I can please her. And it's no different with God. Okay, we, we need to know his will so we can do it if we're going to have this type of a knowing relationship. And we need to listen to him when he expresses his will to us, and we need to ask him personally <clears throat> if we are uncertain what his will really is. We do that as husband and wife. Our kids do that. Well, they're telling us all the time, you know, when they're growing up, this is what I want, this is what I need, this is what you could do for me, and we listen to them. Which brings us to my third point. If we're going to really know God, we need to know his voice. We need to be able to listen to him. We need to know how to hear from God. <clears throat> listen to the scripture. It says he brings out his own sheep and he goes before them and the sheep follow him. Why do they follow him? For they know his voice. So whose voice are you listening to? You know, I, I find the voice of the world is turned up to 10. It's turned up as high as it goes. And it will drown out the voice of God if we're not careful. We won't really know God because we can't follow his will for our lives because we can't hear his voice. We're too busy doing our own thing. And you know what? If we don't learn how to listen to God in prayer, we can't possibly say we know him because we don't know his voice. We listen attentively to the people we really love. We, we get to know them. We get to know their hopes. We get to know their dreams. We get to know their desires in life. Why? Because we're listening attentively to them. Now, there are some people who say they know him, but they don't. Talk is cheap, though, right? 
I mean, I, <clears throat> I saw the President of the United States in Washington, D.C. once, but I don't really know him. I saw my state senator once. I actually met him in the Capitol building. I shook his hand. I talked with him, but I don't really know him. I mean, that next summer I saw him at the state fair by the Lions Corn booth there, and he ignored me. It was like he didn't even remember me. So I don't know him, okay? I've gotten close to some very famous people. Now, I know you younger crowd, I'll give you a few names. You've probably never even heard of them. <clears throat> But it was big stuff when I was younger. Before I was a Christian, I went to the original outdoor play at the Hollywood Amphitheater, Jesus Christ Superstar. And I sat right next to Carol Channing. And we chatted. But I don't really know Carol Channing. I had a beer in the Los Angeles airport with Howard Cosell. And we talked together. I shook hands with and chatted with Ed Sullivan uh, in New Times Square in New York. But I don't know these people, okay? It's not enough to say we've met Jesus and we've hung around him a little bit. We have to really know him. We can't just see him from a distance. You know, Israel, the nation of Israel, waited thousands of years for their Messiah, and then they killed him when he showed up because they didn't really know him. They knew everything about him. They had all of these prophets that had written to them, but they didn't know him. Some people say they know him, but they don't want to hang around him. They're embarrassed about their relationship with this one that they will privately say they know. It's kind of like, you know, when you grow up in a neighborhood and you've got a bunch of friends, but you happen to live next door to the, the, the nerd on the block. And you hang around him sometimes because he's the only kid who will play catch for a while. But then when you see him at school, you pretend you've never met him because nobody else likes him. Now, I know nobody could have ever been that cruel except me maybe in school, but we've seen that spirit before. We actually know this person, but we're embarrassed that we know them. Sometimes that plays out in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We kind of know him, but we're a little bit embarrassed about that. And then, of course, we've got people that choose to elevate themselves above their creator because they don't really know how important it is to know him. They don't know their place. They don't know the nature of the relationship that they have with Jesus Christ. Listen to Jeremiah in chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. He's, he's speaking for God here. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. You want to glory in something? You want to feel good about something? You want to get a little puffed up spiritually about something? Jeremiah says, hey, glory in the fact that you know God. Not your own might, not your own wisdom, not the riches you've accumulated, See, people who really know the Lord have to be humble because God will never respond to a love relationship that is centered on self. So what's Jeremiah really saying? He says, you know, some people will boast in their own wisdom. And yet the scripture says the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Yet there are a lot of people who will boast in their own intellect. I mean, there's no shortage of people who think they know everything businessmen and their empires. We've got some people running for political offices right now who, who come across with a message that they're pretty smart. They're pretty intelligent. They've got all this wisdom. Businessmen, politicians, professionals in any specialized field, you know, the field of medicine, technology, research, whatever it is, there are plenty of people who will boast in their own intellect, in their own wisdom, but they never boast about a knowledge of who their creator is who gave them that wisdom and who gave them that intellect and who gave them that ability? Jeremiah says some will boast in their might, their personal achievements, you know, the sports world, the, the business world, the people with special talents. We, we, we've got Guinness Book of World Records and the amazing things that, that people have accomplished and then they go on to gladly boast about those things when they should be boasting about their God. There, there's a guy who actually swam across the Atlantic Ocean 
Took him 73 days, 3,716 miles to complete that mammoth task, a Frenchman. There's, there's a guy who completed the longest run in the world. He ran nonstop for 350 miles, 80 hours of running. And then there's a guy who boasts of the fact that uh, he held his breath longer than anybody who ever held their breath. He held his breath for 17 minutes and 19 seconds. Spent his life training to do that. And you know what? God's not all that impressed. If you can't boast in God, it doesn't matter if you can hold your breath for a month or if you can swim across every ocean. And then Jeremiah says some will boast in their riches. You know, with, with a net worth of $81.5 billion, Bill Gates is proclaimed to be the richest man in America. And I, I guess he may have some things to boast about. I mean, he's built an amazing empire. He also built himself a pretty nice home. Took him seven years and $63 million to build his home. So, I mean, he may have a few bragging rights. You, you know, the house was built with 500-year-old Douglas fir trees, and it took 300 construction workers, Joe Paul now, to build that house. <laughs> Do you ever hire 300 when you get on a project? Half a million board feet of lumber needed to complete the project. And when guests arrive, they're given a pin that interacts with them throughout the house, and amazing things happen. Temperatures change, and lighting preferences change according to what they've entered in, and these sensors pick them up. Speakers behind wallpaper play the music that they want to hear. They can change the artwork on the walls with a push of a button. I mean, it's an amazing place. <clears throat> it has 24 bathrooms. So you're probably in good shape when you visit. Six kitchens. His garages accommodate 23 cars, and the sand he put on his beach is actually imported from the Caribbean because sand in America apparently isn't good enough. So I guess he can boast a little bit. But you know what? It doesn't matter what you accomplish or how much money you have or how amazing you can prove you have been. We need to boast in God's wisdom, in God's might, and in God's riches, not our own. Because here's the reality. When you really love somebody, you boast in them, not yourself. These are my kids. These are my grandchildren. This is my spouse. These are the people I care about. We need to be boasting in our God. And if there is a fault to be leveled against all of us as disciple makers and followers of Jesus Christ is, we probably do not boast about him nearly enough. Maybe that's because we don't know him well enough. Maybe we don't really know his love. Maybe we don't really know his will. Maybe we don't really know his voice. Maybe we're a little bit embarrassed about our relationship with him. I don't know. Maybe we're off on a tangent building our own kingdoms and boasting in our intellect and in our might and in our riches. I don't know that either, but we better make sure that's not the case for us as an individual. I want to be able to boast about my God. I want to be able to glory in the fact that I know Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. I know him on a personal basis, and he knows me. Now, we've got some people who say they know him, but they won't submit to his authority. They won't really obey him. You know, in the end, Jesus is going to say, well done, not well said. It doesn't matter if you say you know him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And listen to 1 John 2, 4. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. That's bold stuff. I didn't write that, okay? That is inspired scripture. He who says he knows God, who knows Jesus Christ and does not keep his commandments is a liar. So you can't just come to church and sit on the pew and sing the songs and clap your hands and get involved in some fashion and talk about knowing Jesus Christ and then go out and not obey him. Because our lifestyle, not what we say, shows how well we really know Jesus. Listen to the Lord speaking in Matthew 7. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does my will, the will of my Father in heaven. And of course, those people protested. And they said, what are you talking about? 
you know, we're your children. We're going to make it to heaven. He says, I will declare to them I never knew you. Listen, I want to know God, but I want to make sure he knows me. And I want to make sure he knows me as an obedient child, not a disobedient pretender. There are no areas in our lives where we can pretend to be obedient. He expects us to be obedient to all of his word to the best of our ability. Can we do that without ever failing? No, but we should always be striving. Our intentions should always be pure. We should always be giving God our best. Because if we say we love him and we say we know him, but we don't obey him, we are spiritual liars. So Jesus says, I never knew you. Well, I want to make sure he knows me. Listen to 1 John 2, 3. By this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. <clears throat> How do you really know you know him if you're a commandment keeper? And the first and greatest commandment is to love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Does our life reflect that every day? Is it easy for God to look at the way we live and say, yep, first commandment keeper. And he or she loves their neighbor as they love themselves. They, these are people who are obedient to the very foundation of all truth that I've established for them. They know me, and I know them, and I know them as obedient children. Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. Pastor talked about that scripture this morning, too. You keep his word, and the love of God will be perfected in you. So is that our desire? Is that your desire? That the love of God would be perfected in your heart, that you would know him so intimately that his love would be perfected in your life, that you wouldn't just be a distant Christian, that you would never be found just going through the motions, that it's not just a ritual. You know why we have so many people who are turned off by religion? Because religion is not comprised of a majority of people that absolutely know God and God knows them. They're not always obedient. And people point out the hypocrisy of that kind of a relationship. I don't want to be a spiritual hypocrite. If I say I know God, I want to be able to prove it by the fact of what the Word says, that I'm obedient to His will. And you know what? When I'm not obedient, I want to be broken. I want to be like David, a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Oh God, thou will not despise, David said in Psalm 51 when he was repenting of his sin. God wants to find us broken when we mess up and when we sin and when we fall short. And when we do that, he always responds with a spirit of love. It shows him that we really do know him. We know his will. We know his voice. We know his desire. We know his love. And the last thing we want to do is hurt the one that really loves us that much. I mean, you, you married folks, you've hurt your spouses. We all have. We've hurt their feelings. We've done things that we're ashamed of. We, we do things in relationships of love that don't ever seem right at times. And you know what? As tragic as that is, it, it pales in comparison to children of God who will hurt him when he's given us the love of Calvary. So what are we going to do to make knowing him intimately so that his love can be perfected in us on that level to make that really become a reality. Well, you know, I don't have some big sophisticated answer for that. I have a very simple one, in fact. More than anything, you need to spend time with him. You cannot continue to know him on a deeper level if you don't spend time with him. You know what? The men that go off in the military and they're gone for two and a half years, they don't know their children and their spouses quite as well when they get back home. And there needs to be the relationship rekindled again. And they need to spend some time listening and talking and sharing and being together. We understand that so well. How can we go for any length of time and not really be spending time with Jesus Christ and talking to him? That's the natural thing to do when you are in love with somebody. And I, I'm always mystified <clears throat> by how hard it is for us to do the natural thing to do. 
I mean, why don't we gather for prayer more often? Why don't we get up earlier more often? Why don't we give up lunch more often? Why don't we spend some time before bed more often? Why do we find time for so many other recreational and pleasure pursuits than hanging around with the one who loves us so much? You know, I, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. You're here on Sunday night, and two-thirds of the church isn't. I, I understand that. But I think we can make a difference in these last days. What, what's going to really be important? I mean, what would people really be impressed with that they could somehow sense in our lives? Wouldn't it be, you know what? I can't really explain it. But Frank seems to know God. Jim Dawson seems to know God. I, you know, I, I don't know God. How are they going to sense that? Well, the love we give, the following we do, the listening that we, we implement in our lives, all these things I've just talked about, the, these signals will go out to a world that needs to know God desperately. How would you like to stand on Judgment Day and not know anything about God? And yet we have multitudes of people, they don't know anything about Jesus Christ. They don't know anything about this word. They don't know God, and yet they boast in their intellect, and they boast in their riches, and they boast in their might. But they can't boast in the fact that they know God. I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to do that humbly. I want to be able to do that in a way that it attracts other people to the kingdom of God. I want to be able to say wistfully and, and with longing in my heart like Paul, man, I wish I knew him. I wish I knew him on a deeper level. I, I wish, I, I, I don't know about the rest of you. Do, do you ever get troubled when you really want to hear the voice of God and you don't seem to know how to hear it? That bothers me because I try and measure everything in my life against the eternal truth of God's word that will never, ever change. And if it says, my sheep follow me because they know my voice, and I'm having a hard time knowing his voice and hearing his voice, there's something wrong with God, right? No, there's something wrong with me. <clears throat> and I need to get that right. We may be sheep, but we're not supposed to be dumb sheep. We're supposed to be compliant sheep who know how to follow, who know how to listen, who know how to obey who know how to hang around the shepherd. That's what, the, all of these analogies and examples that God has given us, Old Testament to new about the shepherd analogy with the sheep, this is what it's really all about. We need that spirit in our lives. We need to know the great shepherd of our souls, and we need to know him more deeply than we ever have. I believe this with all my heart. Perilous times are upon us. The last days are upon us. I don't want to go through the times that could be coming against this world with just limited knowledge about the God that's in charge of orchestrating everything that's going to happen in the last days. <clears throat> I need to know that God. I don't really care what the politicians do. I don't care what the naysayers are saying. I don't care what the sinners are entertaining themselves with nearly as much as I care about what God says. I want to know him. I want to know his voice. I want to know his will. I want to know his love for me. And if I open my heart to that spirit and you do, you know what? God will bless it. God will help you to know him better than you ever have before. And I, you know, I know I'm connected with a lot of people here. I, I'm hearing very positive, good things about people who are going deeper in their relationship with God. They're getting to know him better. And they're, they're amazed at times. They're saying, you know what I found? You know what God spoke to me? You know what I'm sensing in my spirit? You know what I'm feeling? This is all part of this growth process of getting to know God better. And it's happening to the people who will spend time with him on their knees and in his word while they open their hearts. And you know what? Then the shepherd speaks to them. Praise God. Well, we are out of time. I'm going to turn you loose with your questions. I think there's some valuable ones that can help you grow in your understanding of this topic. So please get in your small groups and enjoy that time together. God bless you. I love you guys.